This talk is about money. Okay? Two kinds of money. Let me get my pointer. One is uh, the possibility of making money by producing valuable materials. Think, think platinum. Okay, on that side. And the other is the requirement, if you want to destroy bad elements like fission waste, to spend money. So minimizing that. Okay, so that's the, uh, the setup. Now, um, those of you who know me know that I'm not a theoretician. I don't have a lab, so what can I do to try and contribute to this field? And there's a two-part answer, data mining, data analysis. So this talk falls under the head heading of data mining. So what I'm doing is looking at the database in science, projecting forward part of it, namely LENR rates, how many per second, units of hertz, okay, in order to make an estimate about the engineering and business of either producing or uh, destroying elements. So uh, scientific knowledge about transmutations is going to be used. One of the questions is, can processing systems be engineered to transmute elements? You know, we have this vision of an energy producing device, you know, so will there be another device to feed elements into and uh, something of uh, value happens? Uh, the second question, if so, are these uh, systems commercially viable? Uh, if I went to a VC right now and had a good story for making an energy producing device, I have a fighting chance to get some at least attention if not money. If I go to a VC right now and ask him for money to produce a transportation device, I don't think I would even have a, uh, a, a hope. So this is my uh, absolutely uh, most reduced version of an LENR device, either an experiment or some kind of a commercial device. We're mostly interested in this axis, but you can't avoid this axis, okay? Energy production, of course, you want to make a hotter working fluid and use as little of the reactant produce as little waste as possible. And of course, that's the value of the whole field. Instead of feeding oil through here, we feed a smaller amount of material and uh, get a lot of energy out of it, similarly. As far as transmutations are concerned, this is the axis of interest we want to make or destroy uh, uh, elements, and we want high production rates. And the energy is a byproduct. It's like remediating fission waste. If you can find a way to turn uh, radioactive elements into non-radioactive elements, you'll also get heat. Hey, that's pretty nice. Okay, so this is about reaction rates. They're central to determining if LENR can be used for either power or transmutation. So here's the reactions per second, units of Hertz R. And this, this is the energy axis. If you know the reaction rate, and importantly, know the energy per reaction, which is still a mystery of this field, then you can figure out the why. So th this equation would allow us to take experimental data if we knew that to get reaction rates. Okay, there are problems with that. I'll come back to it. We're talking about transmutations, how many grams of an element can we take per second? Same old reaction rate, gram molecular weight divided by Avogadro's number. Now you can see right away that this is a tough game because that's a big number, okay? So what I'm going to do in the next seven slides is sort of flash the results of previous experimental and theoretical studies that have yielded reaction rates. I uh, could spend a lot of time in each one of these, but if you'll forgive me, I'll go through them. Because all that I'm really interested in is coming up with that number. So this is the Miley Patterson, and it's the first I know of, 1996, the Patterson cell, a fluidized bed uh, kind of arrangement. And they published a absolute reaction rates, uh, normalized to volume. So they give the volume, and you figure out the rate. Okay, so there is an experimental LNR rate. Okay. You could if you make an assumption about the energy per reaction. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I'm happy to do that, but I'm very, very... Well, uh, there's time is one thing, but, uh, you know, my focus is on changing one element into another rather than the, uh, the power aspect of it. Um, the next is a, a Jacques Dufour who's here. He put a palladium cylinder, uh, had an arc across it, and reported the production of lithium at that rate. Okay. So each one of these deserves more attention than I'm able to give it in the uh, time allowed today, but nevertheless, bear with me, please. This you're all familiar with, probably. Uh, Ivo Morrison has this initial experiment, and he had absolute rates over the 120 hours there. So that's the number that we pick out of there. He later did the same thing as you heard from him already in this meeting, uh, using not gas input, but uh, electrochemical uh, production of deuterium, and he came up with a higher rate. And I saw in his graphs yesterday, he has much higher rates than this now, but that isn't going to change my story, all right? Uh, so, so we get that rate out of it. Uh, rolling right along, the uh, Toyota Central R&D Lab, 
uh, replicated his experiment, reported it at the last conference, and uh, for, uh, gave data and per centimeter squared, not per centimeter cube, but it has to make the area and come up with a rate, a very low rate, you see. And then turning from experiment to theory, uh, Yang Kim uh, reported uh, last year uh, uh, an update of something that he started in uh, 1999, and uh, he get a rate of 10 to the 14th out of uh, his work. Okay, so one more of these, please, and then I'll slow down. This is the Wyndham Larson the cartoon of the surface. The uh, the uh, vibrating protons or deuterons on the surface that they couple with the uh, plasmon polaritons and so forth. That they published a, a rates uh, uh, 10 to the 12th to 10 to the 14th, but I uh, got an argument that says only 1% of the surface is active, so that that's the rates. So this is incomplete in a couple of ways. I uh, saw in the tritium panel yesterday a couple of papers that I should have looked at already and added to it. But the, um, the picture, I think, is adequately clear. This is the summary. The ones I just walked through, zoomed through. Uh, these are the conditions. And, and you know, the wide variety of experiments, just amazing. There were four permeation experiments, an arch experiment, lots of different things. And it, when you take the uh, rates from the last few of you guys and put them up, they range over this uh, area here. And I circle this because that's the extreme, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 14. Okay, so we're at a breaking point now. We've mined the field, the data. We have a uh, list of reaction rates. Now we're going to use these reaction rates. And I will start that by showing you two graphs that are um, uh, log log graphs that will allow you to uh, look at the overall picture. This is the uh, one for power production. These are the rates on the horizontal axis. And this is the output power. I cut it off in a millilight because uh, that's near what's measurable. So let's take a relatively high experimental rate, it's 10 to the 14th. And depending on the energy per reaction, you can get a wide variety of the powers. So this speaks to uh, what I was saying about the problem of going from measured rates. You know, some experiment has 10 watts, and you have to go back, and you can get uh, uh, different inferred reaction rates depending, again, on the energy per reaction. So um, is, is the kid well here? Yeah, um, he, he said he, did, he likes linear graphs. He doesn't like log a lot. No, look at this. I'm going to have to send him a copy of this and <laughs> see what he says. So that's the power part. That's not the fo main focus of this, but I wanted to include it because, again, the reaction rates are a, a central aspect of it. This is really the um, centerpiece of this presentation, if you will. So here are reaction rates plotted here in Hertz, log of Hertz. Here's the log of the number of atoms produced or equivalently the number of moles. And for the purpose of this view graph here, I rounded Avogadro's number up to 10 to the 24th. I mean, with so many decades, it doesn't matter, okay? And then over on this side is the absolute weight of the element produced or destroyed in grams here. So we were talking about reaction rates 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 14th, and these are the times over which you are willing to process an input material in order to get what you want or get rid of what you don't want, okay? So, so you, you look at this, you go from these rates, uh, say I, I, I'm willing to work for a month, and you come over here and you say, less than a gram. You know, this is not very encouraging. Conversely, if you say I'm going to produce platinum, and I want to make a, a gram, you know, not an ounce, a gram, and I'm willing to do it in a day, I want to do it in a day, then you have to find out you need a reaction rate that's significantly higher than what's been reported, or predicted theoretically. Okay, so already you're getting the feeling that this is a, um, a tough game. And the um, reason I feel like it's uh, justified to get by with these orders of magnitude and all is because of the answer that falls out of this. Now, if I had done these calculations and found it was marginal factor five or something like that, I wouldn't be giving this talk. Okay, I think there's a uh, story here, despite all of the variations in the rates, experimental and theoretical, and all the uncertainties involved. Okay, so now I'm going into the uh, second part of this talk, and it says, um, okay, let's look at first the production of valuable elements and then the destruction of um, fission waste. Engineering realities. This is an LENR reactor, not for production of energy, but rather for transportation. And you have to bring in the reactants, take out the products, electrical power, atmospheric control, heat removal, all these equipments in red around there. And I'd like you to pause for a moment to consider the dramatic difference in two cases. The reactions occur on the surface, the reactions occur in the bulk. 
okay? Now, there's a lot of evidence that Ellie and I occur on or near surfaces, okay? And that makes the, the engineering of a reactor dramatically easier than if you have to introduce the element that you want to transmute into a material and then get it, the product out of the material. Okay, so that's, a, that's why I call this engineering realities. And in either event, complex equipment in either batch or full process will, will be needed. So, so again, you go back to my statement that I'm, this is not ready for um, the DC world yet. Okay, this is at uh, the conceptual level. And uh, you can imagine that developing a business plan around this <laughs> would be very, very, very difficult. Okay, so this is the, um, the, the graph for um, making money, okay? <laughs> this is the same axis grams plotted in the same direction, and th this is um, uh, the, the cost. <laughs> so if you want aluminum, uh, you know, an ounce of aluminum, pound, you know, whatever. Um, by the way, the U.S. has a uh, $10,000 bill, so this is a one, ten, a hundred, a thousand. I've never seen either of them, <laughs> <laughs> and almost certainly never will. <laughs> In fact, I don't even recognize the name of the guy who's on it. <laughs> 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 so, um, you, you look at this and say if you want to make an ounce of, uh, of platinum or gold, about 1500 USD, long runs, relatively high transportation rates are needed. Okay. And um, yeah, it's gonna depend a lot on the cost of raw materials. If you're gonna transmit one valuable element into another, <laughs> you have less of a margin. So um, I, I won't say that this isn't going to happen, but I can't see it happening in the near term, and I'll come back to that at the, at the end. Okay, so let's go on to the flip side of this, the destruction of fission waste. This is a table from Wikipedia of the elements, long life and, and medium life uh, fission elements. That's what we'd like to get rid of. Right away you say, what if you do cesium-135 and not 137? But 137 is a problem. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, it isn't clear. We have no database yet on the ability to transmute the elements using L, E, and R. And by the way, I'm not talking about using L, E, and R to make neutrons to induce nuclear reactions. I'm talking about having the uh, bad guys participate in the L, E, and R reactions. Okay, and, and then you say, you've got to handle them. Lots, lots of problems. So that's what we're faced with. And I would like to just pause for a moment. Uh, the destruction of elements from fission waste is going to be in the same scale as nuclear reprocess reprocessing plants. These are two photographs of the uh, plant from the hog in uh, France. <coughs> and um, this is the process they have. You know, one, one box is uranium-plutonium separation. You know, so again, just think about taking this massive amount of radioactive waste and introducing it into an LNR reactor. Uh, this is a, is a tough game. And, uh, you know, people have wanted to do this for a long time. The Cincinnati group uh, published some things a long time ago. Uh, the, uh, they had, a, they call it LENT, Low Energy Nuclear Transportation, and they had some experimental data. Uh, but there's very, very, very little data now on the um, ability to uh, actually get into the radioactive waste. There are over 400 fission reactors available worldwide. It might be first necessary to separate some elements out of that waste. That's nuclear reprocessing. That requires a plant such as you just saw. There's one in Sellafield and there are others. Now the amount of radioactive waste produced in the year is on the order of 10,000 cubic meters, roughly equivalent to uh, 50 million moles of elements. A year has three times 10 to the seven seconds, so you have to process a mole per second. Okay, unrealistic using available rates. Immense and expensive facilities would be required in order to keep up with the ongoing stream of waste. And there's a, a person in the back saying, wait a minute, we've got 30 years of waste to cure. <laughs> okay, so uh, these are um, uh, sites in the U.S. where waste is uh, standing around in casks and so forth. So to, uh, to catch up seems just out of the question. So the people who want to use LANR for uh, remediation of radioactive fission waste uh, have a hard sell. Uh, that's one of the zero order messages of this talk. So the summary of the talk, can LENR transmutations be practical for selective production of elements? You know, platinum, but not something nearby. Okay, and thorough destruction of all the elements of radioactive waste. Possibly, mm, maybe, highly unlikely, times are long, costs are high, safety, this is okay, this is terrible. Okay, so I don't see it as a viable commercial alternative in the near term. And um, I know people, so there are many people who are very, very interested in this, and uh, it's, um, I hope, uh, I expect to get some arguments. I even hope to get some arguments, so we'll, we'll see what happens here. 
Okay, now the technical summary is this ridiculously simple equation, grams per second is L-A and R per second, by the, uh, the um, grams per mole divided by Avogadro's number. So we saw values here up to around 10 to the 14th in hertz. This is uh, uranium-239, you multiply those two together, you get about 10 to the 16th divided by 10 to the 23rd, 10 to the minus seven, a year as I said already, is three times 10. So any event, um, if, you, if you want to produce a gram, you can do it in a few months. If you have the ability to do the maximum transmutation rate that's been reported, okay? So it could well be that um, uh, people find out how to produce what Ed calls the nuclear acronym environment, increase the transmutation rate, large surface area materials as in catalysis and so forth. I'm not saying it won't happen. In fact, some of you may be, um, uh, maybe think I lost it because I'm uh, you know, playing futurist here. And I, I um, am only saying that it looks like for the foreseeable future it's going to be very difficult. And if it ever happens, it's going to take sophisticated engineering. And I put this uh, picture of a growing silicon crystal here. You know, when I was in high school, the silicon pool was that big. Now the semiconductor industry is going from uh, 300 millimeters to 450 millimeters. You know, wafers almost a half a meter in diameter. And uh, you say, well, you know, that was uh, a gazillion dollars in a half a century. So if you go ahead a half a century, it could be that the, uh, the uh, transportation becomes practical, but it's going to take a uh, remarkable amount of money. So this is my last view graph. Whether or not transportations are practical, they're an important part of the science of LENR. Current questions include what mechanisms produce them, what are the limitations, can the currents be controlled, can rates be increased, and what are the maximum of available rates. All of these relevant, of course, to the production of energy. Okay. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Ah. Uh, you have to Yeah. Yeah, it looks in the video. Assume that you have a car that takes five kilograms to run it for six months. You go with 100 grams of material. The end of six months, you have 50 grams of transmuted material and a million cars. Now we're talking about things. That's why I was asking about power. How much power? You're talking 10 to the 14th, 10 to the 16th, but that per gram. Now we're talking five kilograms times a million. It's a different ballgame. That's the question. Yeah, that, that's a point very well taken. If the production of energy can produce a valuable element, then it may be possible that the waste from energy production would be commercially viable. In fact, I looked at the relative prices of, um, of the nickel and copper. Turns out copper is less valuable than nickel, if I remember correctly, by a little. Okay, so it remains to be seen whether or not the production of energy will result in um, uh, the production of something that's worth more than the input material. Good point, okay. Now, I do not want to drive a car with fission waste in it. <laughs> so when you go to the other side of the uh, thing, I don't see the same kind of potential leverage uh, as you're bringing up. 50 years in the nuclear power industry and no longer fearing these not bad guy fission products uh, because I think that's a solved problem that we can bury them. Uh, then I, I, I take away all the incentive to try to transmute them. So I think it might be easier to convince everybody that the real hazard of these things is highly overblown and that uh, would be a, an easier sell than to try to transmute them. That's just the comment. Thank you. Now, I, that's another part of what we're taking, and I appreciate that. Um, uh, all those sites just in the U.S., let alone globally, contain large amounts of very highly radioactive material, and they cause no problems right now. Okay? Now, if you have what happened in Fukushima, you know, then you have an unusual event, and you, there can be uh, problems with the, uh, with the, the uh, water drained out of a storage uh, pool or something like that. But your fundamental point is uh, taken, uh, I agree with it, it's well taken, that um, uh, the uh, production of something valuable is a much better opportunity than trying to remediate vision waste. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Tom. Any other? Well, again, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.